One of the problems that Thomas Patterson notes about the presentation of politics in the media is that when one observes politics, there are basically two schema or perspectives or lenses through which one can actually view politics. The first is a game schema, which is the one used predominantly by the media. It emphasizes who's ahead, who's behind, what the different candidate strategies are, and so on. One of the problems with this is that it really tends to filter everything through the lens of strategy, rather than what the candidates really believe is good for the country. For instance, if a candidate says, well, I think that we should uh, cancel all the student debt from college loans, one might say, well, the reason for that is because that student debt is heading toward a moment when, in fact, we will be facing another bubble like the housing bubble from 2008. Or one could say, well, they're doing that because they're trying to get the college student vote. Now, the problem there is that the latter, where they say, oh, they're doing this to try and get people to vote for them, is strategic. That fits in with a game schema. It's just like watching uh, the, the preview to the Super Bowl where every decision that's made uh, going up to the Super Bowl is viewed strategically. How does this help us to win? That is a game schema. A governing schema is really the one that's needed by citizens, where it asks the question, how is my life going to be better if one candidate wins as opposed to the other? Now, this goes to issues of policy. It goes to the issue of how uh, capable the candidate is of fulfilling their promises. It goes to the potential effects of those policies, but it's not as interesting as a game, and it doesn't engage people's attentions many times as in the way that a game might engage people's uh, attentions. The problem is this is the information that we need on candidates in elections, and this is the information that in many cases, unfortunately, the media does not provide for us. Not because the media doesn't want to do this, but because treating politics as a game makes it so that it seems more exciting. Who's ahead? Who's behind? What's the strategies? And so on. But it has other negative effects. First of all, it causes some problems in terms of conventions of language in the news. A lot of times, for instance, news reporters will say when a candidate is on the uh, campaign trail, well, they said nothing new. Now, what they mean is we've heard their policy proposals before. For these reporters, yes, indeed, they've heard these policy proposals before, because the fact is that they have been on the campaign trail with them all the time for months. But they might be new policy proposals for the candidates or for more importantly, the citizens. Those citizens have not heard those proposals before. So when a reporter says, well, they said nothing new, unfortunately, what the audience hears is, well, it's just the same old stuff that politicians always say. That's not what the reporters mean, but that's how they interpret it. This often happens, by the way, after debates. A lot of times they'll say, well, neither candidate really said anything new. You don't really expect to hear much new in a debate. What you expect to hear is an exchange of ideas and someone arguing why their position and their policies are better than the other person's positions or policies. However, many times after a debate, the, uh, the reporters will say, or the commentators will say, well, they said nothing new. And again, what happens is the audience hears, oh, it's, it's the same old politician stuff. And they tune out. As a result, when they do that, first of all, and people in the audience don't consider their policy proposals as new, and secondly, it tends to focus a lot of attention on trivial aspects of the debates and who gets the best line in and so on. Secondly, treating politics as in the game schema often tempts people, especially in debates, to use boxing metaphors. Oh, they really scored a knockout on the, with, with that comment. Oh, that person was hurt with, with that comment, but they weren't taken out. A debate is not a boxing match. A debate is supposed to be an exchange of ideas in which one person tries to convince the public 
that their ideas and policies are better than the others. One of the things you have to think about is what happens when you start to have female candidates? As we, when we had two female can, a female candidate for president in 2016, do you really want them to be saying, well, he really bloodied her on that with that comment using the boxing metaphors? Or she really knocked him out on that with that comment. It shows the absurdity of these metaphors. They shouldn't be used. A debate is not a boxing match. And finally, a lot of times because the, uh, the uh, commentary is so oriented toward a game schema, they mention polls and they talk about polls before debate, after debate. The simple fact is that one of the worst things you can do is to frame a debate based upon who is ahead in the polls because that colors everything that happens afterwards. I re remember in the 1996 presidential campaign when Bill Clinton was running against Bob Dole. And the first thing that they did before the debate was started, or the last thing that they did rather, I should say, is to show the polls which showed that Dole was nowhere near Clinton in polling and he hadn't been since the beginning of the uh, election uh, cycle. What that does is it makes it seem like, oh, well, Dole is completely behind. He has no chance. Let's see if he can do anything at all to pull himself up in this particular debate. But the simple fact is it's not a very good way of doing uh, this kind of thing. And it's a very bad way of framing a discussion. It basically makes you think, well, Dole has no chance. Let's move on. Gaffes are interesting. Gaffes are kind of the Freudian slip of campaigns, or at least they'd like to treat them that way. Well, let me explain. A gaffe is a mistake that a uh, candidate can make that becomes a, a problem or liability to the campaign. I say like a Freudian slip because the idea of a Freudian slip is that when you say something, what you really meant was something else. And when Freud anal analyzed these kind of slips of the tongue, so to speak, he would say, well, actually they reveal something about the unconscious that you normally wouldn't say. Well, gaffes are treated as the same way, as if they actually indicate something that uh, you might not have otherwise known. Classic examples of this, Dan Quayle, 1992 presidential election. Dan Quayle was the vice presidential candidate with George H.W. Bush. And Dan Quayle was in a school in Trenton and he was doing some spelling words with some uh, children. And he was holding up, he had cards that had the spelling of the word on it. Tells one young boy, go to the board and spell potato. Spells potato. But the card that Quayle had, had an E on the end of potato. And he said to the boy, uh, you forgot something at the end there. The boy looked very puzzled, so he put an E on the end, even though he knew that that was not the way he spelled potato. That became a huge, huge blow up in terms of the, uh, the campaign. Everybody was talking about it. Everybody was going on about how Dan Quayle can't spell potato and all this sort of thing. Okay. John Kerry made a statement about uh, funding for the Iraq war where he said that he voted for the bill before he voted against it. That allowed the Bush campaign to say, oh, he's a flip flopper. He doesn't have any consistent uh, views or opinions on things. The fact is you don't want somebody leading the nation three years after the attacks of 9-11 when they do this sort of thing. Well, what John Kerry actually meant was that he voted for the first version of the bill which had funding for the Iraq war, but not for the second version that didn't have funding, but that's not what he said. Now, both of these things show us something about gaffes. And the point about a gaffe is that the idea for the opposition is to find the gaffe, find the wart and make the wart stand for the whole. In other words, find the negative point that is illustrated in the gaff and that make make that stand for the whole campaign of the other person gaffs only have power in cases where it fits in with the image that you're trying to create of that candidate for instance for better or for worse whether it's fair or unfair dan quayle did not have a reputation for being the brightest guy in the room okay 
wasn't the crispiest chip in the bag, according to a lot of people. When he makes a mistake, like he doesn't know how to spell potato, it fits perfectly into that particular uh, narrative. Similarly, if you're making a narrative that says, well, John Curry is a flip-flopper, when he makes a statement like, I voted for it before I voted against it, gives you the perfect opportunity to use that. When does it not work? Well, in one case, we know where it didn't work. When Bill Clinton was running for president in 1992, he mistook one type of uh, 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 armed missile for another, and he missed he he used the wrong term. Immediately, Dan Quayle jumped on and said, "Ah, you know, he doesn't know about this or anything like that." The problem was that one of the things that people did know about Bill Clinton is he's a very bright guy. He's a policy wonk was a Rhodes Scholar, went to Yale Law School. He knows all the details of policy. He can tell you off the top of his head. So how did the Clinton campaign handle that? They said, Governor Clinton misspoke. And that was it. And they were able to handle it that way because of the fact that he did not have the reputation for making mistakes. Um, and when you're in a long campaign, negative advertising becomes inevitable. And it tends to be to take over the campaign in many cases, because it is event-oriented, as these gaffes illustrate. Was accused of letting Willie Horton out on a weekend furlough. He was a prisoner and uh, a felon, and he escaped and went and committed a horrible crime where he raped a woman and pistol whipped her husband. And that became, that went all over the airways, especially since Willie Horton, Horton happened to be African-American. And that was all over the place. And they were blaming all this on Michael Dukakis. In fact, is Michael Dukakis did not create that furlough program. It was created by a Republican governor of Massachusetts who was imitating another Republican governor in creating that program. That other Republican governor was Ronald Reagan. However, that negative advertising had a tremendous effect upon the campaign and as a result, Michael Dukakis lost because of that and other issues. Jennifer Flowers in 1992 was a cabaret singer who's purported to have an, be having an affair with Bill Clinton. Uh, this was handled in a lot of different ways. The mainstream media at first did not want to touch the story, but the tabloids picked it up. And then what the mainstream media did was to report on the tabloids reporting. The problem with this is that more or less pushed all of this away. And now, especially with the competition 24 seven for uh, news stories and so on, a lot of times rumors make it into the uh, mainstream media. And that lends credence a lot of times to the things that could become bases for negative advertising. Now we come up with the idea of news and truth. Okay. According to Walter Lippmann, news is event-oriented, truth is not. News is instant, truth is ongoing. According to Patterson, news is the tip of the iceberg, truth is the iceberg. And what that means is it's not that the news that is reported to you aren't facts, but rather that they are facts that we have right now that are selected from an event-oriented phenomenon. Whereas truth is the whole story within which that phenomenon is located. Tip of the iceberg versus the iceberg. You can see this a lot of times, okay, um, when people talk about character as an issue. Character, a lot of times people say, well, you can see a person's character because they did X, Y, and Z. Well, that's not really true. And it, their character may be reflected in something they do, especially if it's particularly heinous. But the fact is that in most cases, we don't have an idea of a candidate's character. By definition, it's hidden. Character is the truth. All we can get is news about particular events. Another example that I might give you is looking at the situation in the Middle East. When something violent or, or newsworthy happens in the Middle East, it gets reported. But the fact is that people do not know the context of that event, do not know that in fact, if you look at it, that 
that event happens in the context of a whole historical perspective and uh, issue about the Middle East, one that goes back centuries and then uh, becomes especially relevant after World War I and World War II and so on. We get news that tells us about the event in the Middle East. We don't get the truth, which goes back many centuries. So finally, why can't media run campaigns? First of all, they have no accountability for their mistakes. The fact is that you can say one thing one week if you're a commentator, another thing another week. It doesn't matter. People forget. Secondly, there's no historical context or tradition. The political party has a historical context. Tomorrow, the Republicans cannot come out and say, I think we should nationalize all the banks. Or the Democrats can't come out and say, I think we're going to do away with unemployment insurance. They have a long tradition which commits their party to those things. Unless you're in a period of very, very tumultuous change. Which leads us to the third thing. There's no need for continuity in, con in con content. The fact is that you may say one thing about a candidate one week and then say the opposite the next week. Uh, you can present a candidate in one way one week and present them in the opposite way the other week, the next week, as the context changes or as events change. There's no obligation to show candidates in a good light. Political parties aim to show their candidates in the best possible light. There is no commitment on that in media. As a matter of fact, in many cases, there's a commitment to show the more negative things because they are the things that attract uh, attention. There's an emphasis on events over policy. Things that are happening, things that are exciting, are more interesting to people and catch attention more than a particular policy about education or about taxes or about uh, uh, health care or daycare for children. Not only the media is not a political institution. It has different needs from the public. For instance, the media is not designed to motivate people to vote. The media is not designed to put together coalitions to convince voters to vote for a certain person with a commitment that if they vote for that person, that person will pursue certain policies. Media has no interest in this. One of the ironies about media bias is people say, oh, the media is biased to the conservatives, to, to the liberals. No, it isn't. The fact is they have no interest on either side, but that's one of the problems. Because they have no interest in being conservative or liberal in the, in the uh, mainstream media, what ends up happening is that they have no commitment like the political parties do when, they, when you know where they're coming from because they're either Democratic or Republican, to actually try to build a voting and then governing coalition. And finally, as I said before, the media views elections through a game schema using fighting me metaphors. We need a governing schema to decide who it is going to be that is going to best govern the country and for us to make a decision on that. Finally, Patterson uh, suggests that a sugar campaign season would alleviate some of these problems or at least make them less noxious in the political process. The fact is, I'm not sure, because the real problem here is, yes, that media runs elections, but the media run, runs elections because political parties have become weakened. Shorting the campaign season might not help those problems. It might just concentrate them. Um, also, the fact is it's not really a practical solution because when we look at the political situation as it exists today, the fact is that every state wants to be first. And so they're, in, in order for us to compress the political system, a uh, politi political process, we have to uh, get Iowa to have their caucuses later, New Hampshire to have their primaries later, and what can end up happening is other states will say, well, well then we'll have ours earlier because we want more influence in the process would be very difficult to do practically. This isn't a criticism of Patterson. I'll let you in on a little secret. The fact is that social scientists are very good 
at analyzing problems, not so good at advocating solutions. Would this help if, in fact, the campaign season were shorter? Let me tell you a, a brief joke. It's not a particularly hilarious joke, but it does make a point. At one time, someone once said, well, you know, the fact is that statistics show that the most dangerous car to be on is in a, if you're a passenger on a train is the last car. And somebody says in response, well, why don't you just take it off? Well, you can't take off the last car because then the next car becomes the last car. Obviously, that's the point of the joke. Shortening the campaign season might not cause, solve these problems. It might just concentrate them. It may be the case that unless there are stronger political parties, you can't take the last car off.